Folks, it's Freaky Friday. Congratulations. We've made it to the end of another off-season week, and I've got even better news for you on this edition of the Podcast Daily. It's a mailbag, and we're so close to Big Ten Media Days that we know who will be representing the Ohio State Buckeyes. So before we get into that, let's get into the news of Thursday, which was that Jack Sawyer, Denzel Burke, and Emeka Ibuka will be representing the Buckeyes in Indianapolis, and we're a week and a half away Bill, uh, your thoughts on those three picks for the Buckeyes? Yeah, that's probably who I would have guessed. Um, again, like JT Tulimoloa would have been a certainly good candidate. Donovan Jackson would have been. But I think based off the way the offseason went, like Jack Sawyer definitely had to go. He felt like kind of the ringleader of, of everyone's decision to return. I know it wasn't quite that simple, but but he sort of did feel that way. Denzel Burke has emerged as a spokesman for the team, the truth teller, as you say, and uh, Emeka oh, yeah. has been a, been, a, been a stalwart of the program. So I guess there was the, well, no, I guess there was no chance they would bring Will Howard because that would be an indication that Will Howard is a team starting quarterback and Ryan Day doesn't <laughs> want to say that yet. So um, that that trio makes sense to me. Um, I, I, again, you could have added Donovan um, or, or JT, and, and I think that would have made sense too, but these would have been the three that I picked, I think, if I were in charge of making the decision. Yeah, I mean, you can't really go wrong with any of these guys or any of the guys that came back. I mean, the the future president and vice president, uh, you know, Cody Simon and Donovan Jackson together would have been a, a good combination. But I don't think that any of these guys are the wrong guy. They're all excellent representatives of the program. I like that they're three very distinctly different personalities, um, and that will at least provide a little bit of, uh, you know, differentiation between the conversations because um, Ameka is very thoughtful and make sure he's you know um a little careful with what he says jack speaks from the hip and uh denzel just says whatever he wants which i love so Ameka is very polished and thoughtful with that but he also will give you the straight no nonsense take on what's going on um so i, I think this is the most excited i've been for a threesome of buckeyes going to indianapolis or chicago like ever they, normally there's just one person going, even if you really like their personality, you know that there's not going to be anything during their hour in, at the microphone that you have to go listen to. Like, I don't, don't feel like I have to name names. I feel like anybody could go through the last dozen years and see exactly what I mean by that. But all three of these guys are going to like, Jack is going to probably have to apologize for his language a couple of times. I love that. Uh, um, Mecca is going to say some things about, what's happened in the rivalry from the last three years that I think, you know, we got into that a little bit during uh, buck nine at the fairway Columbus with him a couple of months ago. Um, that stuff will be great. And Denzel will say literally anything that is on his mind about any question you ask as Berm said. So I love it. This is the, I've been very vocal in how I think that media days have outlived their usefulness, uh, especially for um, local media. But, I am like looking forward to this collection of Buckeyes and Ryan Day way more than I have at any other point dating back to when it was in Chicago or before that. Do you think that the fact that this is like inside baseball, but I don't care. Uh, the fact that uh, Big Ten Media Days is now three days. Do you think that means it's going to be like more of a zoo around the Ohio State guys or that fewer media will actually be there because there aren't as many teams going at the same on the same day as Ohio State because it's spread out a little more? No one will ever skip Ohio State's day, ever. So you think every, Ohio State's the first day. You think everyone will be in town for Ohio State regardless of who they cover? Yeah, Tony Petiti uh, yeah. will go first thing on Tuesday to kick it off, and then Ohio State's there. And I, That's personally how I would prefer it. Like I think that Ohio State is the flagship program for the Big Ten. You can say with Michigan if you want, um, but that's also why they go on separate days because – they are going to dominate the conversation. I hate it when it's like, go listen to the state of the Big Ten on Tuesday morning and hang around and let Ohio State go last thing on Wednesday to trap people there, um, which is what, like, even when Michigan goes last, almost always people will be skipping out and bailing on that. They only want to hear from Ohio State. They are the, the needle mover in the league. This is ideal for us, and I think it does mean, Bill, that it will be an absolute circus on that Tuesday. Oh boy, can't wait. Ohio State yeah. uh on that day. It's Ohio State. Wow, this is it's interesting. It's Ohio State, Northwestern, Illinois, Wisconsin, Rutgers, and Purdue. Ohio huh. State is, 
is definitely the show. <laughs> well, that's wow. Me. Who would have guessed? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Well, you can't, you got to make it easier for the people that parachute in the national media. Like, we don't can't have them distracted or writing too many stories. You got to go in and do your Ohio State thing and not worry about literally anybody else, which they will not. That, that's right. They will just be following around those three players in Ryan Day. Austin's I know gonna be lining, Austin's going to be lining up national media members for their takes on Ohio State's roster building and challenge them all to an arm wrestling match one by one until they're all they'll get taken down. I hope they swing by our setup and that we can, you know, engage in some good old fashioned debate and maybe change some minds. Maybe that should be my mission yeah. in Indianapolis this year. I'm trying to change hearts. That's oh. all. Mm. Good. Yeah, that's a, that'll put a nice bow on that. Now let's get into the mailbag, Bill. Okay, let's do it. Uh, again, we got like, uh, I don't know, 70 questions, so I couldn't get to all of them, but uh, I picked a few out. Uh, I want to start with this one. Uh, this is from Scott referencing uh, the Kings of Columbus episode I did midweek when I talked to some people who cover uh, Penn State, Oregon, and Michigan, just about Ohio State's toughest opponents. Uh, and he wrote in, uh, ever listening to Kings of Columbus and the three opponents, am I the only one? more concerned about Michigan than Oregon. I feel like Oregon has very exploitable issues and that Michigan could be a much more difficult game. Let me know if it's just me. And like, I'll, I'll ask that question, like understanding that the Michigan game, like means a whole lot more. I mean, there's like, there's a lot more writing on that game, but from like a, a pure football test standpoint, which of those three games do you think will be the most difficult for Ohio state? Uh, I mean, I think Oregon is the toughest because it's on the road. It's it's a traveling to the West Coast, which is unusual and not something Ohio State does very often. Uh, obviously, that game will be circled as a you know top two or three matchup in, in the country probably by that time of the year. Michigan, I think, gets harder as the year goes along as they start to figure out what they are offensively. I think if you played Michigan early in the year, it would feel less daunting um and I, I know michigan lost a lot i have been pretty adamant that i still think they're going to be pretty good this year and uh, i even and by saying that i i recognize that pretty good could mean that they lose three games because they play a tough schedule um and penn state at penn state is never an easy game uh, so i think the order goes P oregon penn state michigan but I, I i don't think any of them are something where you can just guarantee it's a win I think Oregon is the uh, biggest test on the schedule and there's historical rivalry implications that clearly are going to weigh in at the end of November. I'm not, I'm not discounting that at all. The reason that Michigan is knocked down a peg or two for me is lack of quarterback clarity and the fact that the game is in the horseshoe, like Michigan has a very good defense. I'm sure they'll patch things together offensively in some form or fashion. Like I, Bill, when we did the exercise going through win totals, it's like I have doubts about Michigan, but even the conversation about their schedule doesn't really – they're at their toughest games outside of Ohio State are in the big house. Like they can get to 10-2 and two, I think pretty easily without necessarily being a great football team, which I don't, I don't think that they will be this year because of all of the people they lost. So you can't discount the, uh, I don't know, lingering – uh, cloud of, of the rivalry and the losing streak for Ohio State. They're going to have to get past that. I think that makes it, I think, a bigger game than Penn State uh, for me. But Oregon, with it being the first massive true test for a lot of the, for some of the younger guys, for Will Howard with Ohio State, seeing what the offense looks like with Chip Kelly, with the way they've uh, recruited under Dan Lanning and have built sort of the offensive and defensive line, even if there's been some flux with their roster going on the road, as Byrne mentioned, uh, not just on the road, but going to the West coast. Like, I think that that is for me, like a clear number one, it is the biggest test on the, on the entire schedule for Ohio state. Uh, I am in agreement with you guys. I, I think it's Oregon as well. Um, I understand where the question's coming from. And, and it's like almost, I do think it's like two separate questions. Like what is more meaningful? It's the Michigan game. What has more riding on it? It's the Michigan game. Who's better football team. I think Oregon's better than Michigan. Um, and they'll play each other, and maybe I'll be proven wrong with that. But but I think for right now that that's kind of where I land. And I think like when I think of Oregon, Penn State, Michigan, and like the offensive and defensive units of all three of those teams, I think it's possible that Michigan's defense is the best, and that Michigan's offense is the worst. 
Um, and like I, it's, I think it's possible that Michigan's offense kind of stinks this year. Like a, a new quarterback, like whole new offensive line, a new offensive coordinator, a head coach who's like kind of trying to be both. Like, well, there's a lot, a lot of variables there that could lead to Michigan maybe never finding its footing offensively. And I just kind of think Oregon is is ready to roll from week one. And Ohio State's got to go play there. And when I was talking with with Tyson Alger, who covers Oregon, he said like this is the biggest game that Oregon has ever played. Like it is going to be an absolute scene in at Alston Stadium for for that game. So like that's that amplifies it even more. So um, I think like environment, talent on Oregon. I, I think that's that is the more difficult game as I look at it right now. And I, and I don't even know if it's particularly close. Go ahead, Bert, I'm sorry. I I think it's like I have not looked at Oregon's schedule for this season, but it's actually a pretty difficult ride they have. Yeah, uh, I mean they play at Oregon State. They play. They have to go to Sparty. They have to play at Michigan. They have to play at Wisconsin in November. Uh, you know, at Washington, they get at home. So they get Ohio State and Washington at home. But like I, Oregon is a you know a team. Well, that you skipped has. skipped one thing about how hard the ride is for them, which is that after they play Ohio State, they have to turn around and go to West Lafayette on a Friday night. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's actually a really uh, I know they've become sort of a media darling and a in a playoff pick for everyone, but like I've never really looked at their schedule you could see if a, a way for them to lose three games this year especially if ohio state beats them like that that's an interesting the big 10 is going to be a fun it's going to be a fun schedule yeah I, I think i think oregon and michigan could both i mean i would be surprised if oregon doesn't have 10 wins but um i think oregon and Michigan both could be like an interesting exercise in how you treat a nine win team in the 12 team playoff world because even a nine and three record could still be a better body of work than what a lot of teams have to offer, but yeah, it, it is not an easy schedule. That's that's for sure. It's it's a challenge. Okay. Um, great let's question. Move on. It was a good question. <clears throat> uh, I, I, we've talked about this, but maybe maybe we can just refresh the conversation a little bit to remind people kind of where we stand. Um, Dana asked uh, who we think will be awarded the Blocko jersey this year. Um, I think we've talked about Jack Sawyer a lot. She, her pick, she said, is Lathan Ransom. Um, but I think we've talked about Jack quite a bit. Are we all still thinking it's going to be Jack, or has has any mind any minds been changed on that? Uh, no, no minds have been changed. I, I I agree. Lathan's a guy who, in a normal year, probably would be a contender for it. But Jack, being from Pickerington, coming back, being the ringleader, bringing everyone back, like I, I would, I would be stunned if it's not him. Especially considering if you think about the Big Ten Media Day representatives being Jack, not Lathan. Uh, you know, uh, I would be stunned. Yeah. Or, or Denzel, not Lathan, even for that matter. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that, especially if it's got to go. Doesn't it? Doesn't have to. If they want it to go from uh, an in-state, you know, veteran, senior, and captain, like Jack Sawyer is going to check check all those boxes off. It's it's tough for me to. I was, I thought that Cade Silver would get it last year, so certainly we can be wrong about that, but it. This one feels about as clear cut as it could possibly be to me. Yeah, I'm, I agree. I, I I do think it's going to be Jack, unless like I don't know, though, Court Williams maybe, like just for like being a guy who's been around a long time and gone through a lot of stuff and and does seem to have pretty strong leadership qualities. But I I think you probably want that. I know Cam Bab had it, but I think I think ideally you'd want the Black O to be someone you're certain is going to be on the field for you too in the fall. And I don't, I don't really know what to make of court Williams chances of, of playing much this fall. So um, he checks a lot of boxes, I think, but I don't know that he would be the pick over a guy like Jack Sawyer. It also speaks to the, we've talked about like the depth and obviously the players all coming back, how important that is to have so many guys putting off the NFL. But I was thinking about that with just the group of people that they could have considered to take to Indianapolis. Like this is the, Aside from on-field stuff, in terms of veteran leadership, this is about as that group is also deep. And the people that yeah. could wear the block O, it's not just like it has to be Jack or nobody. I mean, you could make strong cases for Lathan Ransom. You could make strong cases for Denzel Burke. As you mentioned, you could go a different way with Court Williams sticking things out. You could put it on somebody like Tyleek Williams or Ty Hamilton. You could do that with Donovan Jackson. Like There are, there are a number of uh, – Travion Henderson. There are a number of guys who have – stuck through that whole process but if it's important for it to be someone who grew up in the buckeye state to wear the block o i think that that's probably the final trump card there for jack yeah i think that's right 
Uh, let's move on. Another question uh, from John. Uh, I'm going to change John's question. Well, I guess Love I'll do that. that. Well, because because I think I think the answer to the question, sort of as it's written, is fairly simple. He asks, like, what are the percent chances you give Tavy and St. Clair of becoming the starting quarterback at Ohio State at some point in his career? And like, my answer is a hundred. So is anyone is anyone not a hundred? Yeah, I mean, would you want to need ninety ninety nine point nine just to account for variables? But like, barring something catastrophic, it sure shapes up for him to be the starter in two years. Okay. So that's how I wanted to change the question. Three, three years. I mean, at least. He is now a five star everywhere. He could. He's. I don't, he's got a chance to be the number one quarterback in the class when it's all said and done. A reasonable chance, and it's going to be wide open again after this year. Does he have any chance of showing up and winning the starting job in twenty twenty five? I think I, Berm's gonna, I think Berm's about to talk himself into it. You could tell by that deep <laughs> sigh. Is there a chance? Of course, there's a chance. I mean, he. We have talked uh, ad nauseum about uh, the advantage he has of being so close to Columbus and the opportunity he's had to learn the system and be more involved in in R- Ryan Day's quarterback academy than anyone else that Ryan Day has recruited has. He obviously has the college-ready size. He's not someone who's going to come in and and look out of place. He's not going to come in and be uh, n- you know, a guy that Mick Marotti has to transform in the weight room. So there are advantages he has over traditional incoming freshmen, and con- considering the fact that we fully expect that you go into 2025 with no presumptive or returning starter, like, yeah, there's a chance. But... Julian Sands really freaking good. We don't know what's going to happen with Devin Brown. He could still be on the roster. Uh, so could Lincoln Keenholz. So could Aaron Nolan. Like, there's uh, if there's five guys again on the roster next year, then absolutely no way. Uh, if there's three guys on the roster, sure, maybe it's a competition that's worth paying attention to for a few weeks in spring. But I still think it would end up being someone that has a little more time in the system. Yeah, you listed all the advantages that Tavian St. Clair will have, and it's the disadvantages for me of time. Like, even if he has been around a lot in the summer, even if he can get an advanced look and some extra instruction with Chip Kelly and Ryan Day and, you know, keep, sleep with the playbook, uh, you know, under his pillow and to get ready for 2025, that's still not going to be the same as all of the practice reps that Devin Brown, Lincoln Keenholz, uh, Julian Sand, and Aaron Oland are going to get this fall. Now, we still don't know exactly how Ohio State and Ryan Day are going to manage that. And that's a whole nother conversation, one we've had many times. But yeah, as you said, if it if it narrows down to like two of those guys instead of four of them, all right, well, let's let's have a different conversation. But in some form or fashion, all of them are going to have at least one year in the system, yeah. in the weight room. And whether they get a ton of reps in the in season this year or not, that's still going to be, I think, a pretty significant differentiator. I don't think Ohio State ever wants like, people are ha- always try to belittle around draft season right bill it's like oh well it's, it's pretty easy what they've done for these like anybody can do it it's a system quarterback job there at ohio state i don't really think that that's reality and i think that there are a lot more responsibilities on the plate of the ohio state quarterback than almost ever it gets credit for and you just i don't think ryan day would ever want to be in a situ- situation where he has to turn the reins over to a true freshman i don't think he would either I, I I won't dismiss the idea that a, a special true freshman could, could maybe get him off of that idea. And perhaps Tavian St. Clair is, is that player. Right now, I would I would I would answer my own question and probably say I it seems pretty unlikely that Tavian would be the starter as, as a true freshman, but the fact that it, it figures to be wide open gives him at least some chance of competing for it. The, the only thing that is in the back of my mind is this idea of wanting to run the quarterback more and putting perhaps more of a premium on the athletic ability of of that particular player and i love julian saying he can throw the crap out of the ball and he's got great feel for the game but he's little and doesn't run or doesn't run a lot and tavian st Clair is gigantic with a big old <laughs> arm and seems pretty athletic to me so like I, I i don't know um again i would i would say no but i'm not going to be entirely dismissive of the idea because we've seen can, we've seen true freshmen play and play well at this level it, it can happen do the odds of him being the starter as a freshman go up or down if ohio state wins a national championship this year down uh i might say up because i think if you win a national championship this year then some guys who might be on the fence about leaving 
as up as underclassmen might go. And then you're looking at like more of a reset. And then if you're in more of a reset, you might be more willing to reset with a true freshman quarterback. If you think that guy's the best. I think I'm going to use the exact same logic that you use to make the counter argument, which is that you could get the most stability than if you have turnover mm -hmm. everywhere else by, by keeping, if Devin Brown plays whatever role he plays this year, could be the starter, could just be, as Berm has mentioned, like a, a worst case scenario where he comes off the bench and helps Ohio State win a game and becomes a folk hero that way. Like, well, if everybody else is leaving, Devin Brown, like, we need you badly. Here, then you put some like NIL money towards that, like s stabilize the position for another year. I don't think that that's uh, an outlandish scenario that could play out, depending on what happens. If, if Ohio State wins a national championship, they will lose people. Uh, it won't be the same amount of folks coming back that they had this year. You're absolutely right about that, Bill. And I think that would make it less likely that they would want to like completely start over from day one uh, with a true freshman quarterback. I think that would yeah. that drops it for me. There's another hypothetical that I'd like to throw out, but I feel like it's too negative, and I don't want to. Because, oh, oh, come God. on. You've already oh, no. teased it. I know what it is. Go ahead. Like, <laughs> if Ohio State were to not beat Michigan – and 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 then not win the college football playoff, and for whatever reason Ryan Day wasn't returning. We don't know if, T but Tavian St. Clair still went to Ohio State because he loves Ohio State and he's from Ohio. And the new the new coach came in and was able to convince him to stay. Do his odds go up or down of being the starter <laughs> as a true freshman? Uh, up, I would think. I don't know who who's the new head coach. Well, now we're really getting into the weeds. Um, the new head coach would be Marcus Freeman. No. In this it's hypothetical. Gonna, it's going to be an absolute feature Ap film in the comments section for this episode. <laughs> in, this in this hypothetical. They're just going to bring Marcus in after he gets fired at Notre Dame? Why would he get fired at Notre Dame? They're going to win 11 games this year. No, they're not. Their schedule's kind of kind of sucks. They might. Their schedule has sucked the last two years as well. What happened? That's a fair point. Uh, it, but it, but it really sucks this year. Yeah. Like. Okay. They, they should own the, the only game they should be. The, the only games that should be a battle for them are at Texas A and M and Florida State. Like, they and then Southern Cal the last game of the season. So, like they should win. They should win eleven games. Okay, but they won't. <laughs> you want to maybe play, play, place a bet right now this is a hypothetical okay <clears throat> well we all agree the odds go up there doesn't matter who the head coach is what draft king sports book and casino oh, <laughs> right it's on my frequently used apps that's a, how about oh. that okay i think their win total for notre dame is uh nine, nine and a half yeah or ten, take yeah, I think take the over if it's nine and a half take the over all right, uh, let's move on to another question before Burn fires more people. Um, <laughs> this, uh, oh, here's a fun one. Who's the most overrated head coach in college football? That's from Jason. Ooh. Lane is it Marcus, Free is it Marcus Freeman? <laughs> no, I, don't, I think he's properly rated. Lane Kiffin is by far the most overrated head coach in college football. And there's literally, I don't even know who would be second. Mm. Lincoln Riley, I guess. Lincoln Riley. Lincoln yeah. Riley. I mean, I, I, I immediately <laughs> remember who was second. Um, but Lane Kiffin has built this cult of personality around him that doesn't match what his actual personality is, which is boring and dry and uncomfortable, unless he's completely changed over the last dozen years, which I doubt. He just knows how to speak in sound bites and use social media to mask the rest which is he's a very good play caller, one of the best play callers that I've uh, covered in my career for sure. He He's right up there, and he can he can dial up ball plays just like Ryan Day can. Uh, he's done good things with a number of quarterbacks over uh, the last 15 years in college football as well. But in terms of like actually managing a program day in and day out, there is no person that I would trust less than Lane Kiffin. <laughs> So you're not you don't have Ole Miss in the playoff this year? Absolutely not. No, they're a trendy pick. People like them. That's because they want. They think like the idea of Lane Kiffin is so exciting. Oh, get get him in the playoff and like just turn on your recorder. Okay, 
sit through a Lane Kiffin press conference and then tell me what a great time you had afterwards. I promise you will want to take a drink with you and maybe two. <laughs> Bro, who do you think is the most over your head coach? The only one that I keep going back to is Lincoln Riley, and I, I don't like to say that because I think he's a good coach, but I think like for all of the conversation about Ryan Day being born on third base and blah, 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 like Lincoln Riley did that first. And he was halfway home. Like I, I just uh and and he's not gotten better as a head coach. I don't like that's the thing that would concern me if I was a USC fan. Like I think it, it seems like he has gotten worse as a program builder, yeah. program runner. Um and, and I think that and I don't I don't mean to speak out of turn or maybe I'm saying something that's completely wrong, but I feel like when you choose to go to a place where it doesn't really matter if you win or lose because no one's paying attention that it, it makes me question your competitiveness. And I think when he left Oklahoma to go to USC, just, and I know he got a good, you know, a lot of money and a nice house and great weather and all that stuff. But like, no one cares if you win at USC, as long as you win eight, nine games a year, which he should do uh, sleeping, like he could stay there forever. And I, to me, like, I don't know that I would want to coach. You'd be comfortable with that. I'm not sure that's actually true for USC. They, you don't think so? I mean, they gave Clay Helton got a pretty long leash, but I, yeah, I don't know if they do that again. I, I think I, I, I think if Lincoln Riley, what's this? This is his third year at USC. He's going into. Yeah. If they're especially now like a 12 team playoff world, like if they don't have a couple of playoff berths by like the time he's, I don't know, six years into this thing, I don't, I don't know that he's all that comfortable. I mean, they went eleven and three and two years ago, eight and five last year, losing five of their last seven. And like he's what, seventy four and eighteen in his career as a head coach, which seems like it's pretty good, but like it just doesn't seem like it's actually getting better. I, I agree that, with that. Yeah. I think that the quick trigger that they showed with the person that I named when Lane Kiffin was fired on the tarmac is a reflection that USC's itself expectations of its program and what that fan base puts on it are, are a little bit higher than I think maybe you give it credit for Berm. Like I, it's not the sec pressure, which I think Lincoln Riley wanted no part of. It is not the same as being in Columbus and, and maybe it's not even that close, but in terms of college football, coast to coast, USC still views itself and its fans still view that as a, top 10 program and one that needs to win national championships. So I, I don't, I don't think he caught a break there in terms of the pressure and I think winning, nine, winning nine games won't save him. I, I don't, I don't think that's going to be good enough for them. If he does that, even the next two years, like he'll be gone. Clay Helton to me is a good example of how long they're willing to let it go. Like Steve Sarkeesian, Lane Kiffin, like those guys were embarrassing the program and like on a personal level. And I think that that was more why they, moved on so quickly from those guys as opposed to like, Hey, we're okay with it might win 10 games every two years. It might not. I don't know, but hopefully it's different now that they're in the big 10. But again, let's look at their schedule. They got LSU, Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn state, Maryland, Washington, Nebraska, who's going to be pretty good. UCLA and Notre Dame. That does not sound like a bunch of wins to me for <laughs> USC. I think USC's win totals like seven and a half. Yeah, and they were pretty, and they pretty were, low. And they were begging LSU to get out of that game. Yeah. And they were eight and five with the number one draft pick on their team last year. Yeah. Hmm. So, All right. yeah, I think the answer is Lincoln Riley as far as who's, who's the most overrated head coach in college football. Bill hasn't answered yet. No, I'm, I'm with, I'm with Burma Lincoln Riley. I think, I don't know. I think Lane Kiffin's also a good answer. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think like who else gets gets gassed up in like these James top Franklin. coach rankings. James, yeah, you know, yeah. James Franklin's tough because like historically, like at Penn State, he's done pretty well, right? Like consistently winning ten games more often than not is not a given at Penn State necessarily, but he also does it while like never winning the biggest games. So, um, like he's a good coach, I think, not a great coach, and I think he gets treated like a great coach sometimes. Um, so that's probably a reasonable answer too. I would maybe say Lincoln Riley before James Franklin, but James Franklin's a good answer. Yeah, um, I, I actually think James Franklin, like I think James Franklin's a better coach than Austin thinks he is. Austin thinks he's like, and he thinks he's Mike Loxley bad, but like I, 
I think James Franklin does a good job. Are, are you saying you don't think that? No one is Mike Loxley bad. Let's be very clear about that. Okay, well, you you are no fan of James Franklin as a head coach. And, I'm not. And he's, and he's made plenty of reasons for that to me. Like I think like you can just look at, as Bill said, he doesn't beat Ohio State or Michigan ever. Uh, and that's a problem. So uh, until you start winning those games, it's hard for me to elevate you into the next realm. But also, it's Penn State, and you know they were winning what eight games a year before that, right? So how many? Yeah. Do you get? So I don't know. It's an interesting conversation. I know that there's a lot of people nationally who would put Ryan Day in that conversation. And I, I I would not, but people will. Uh, let's kind of keep it in line with a more general college football question. And we'll get back to Ohio state stuff. Um, from Josh, is there a game outside of the Ohio state schedule this season that you are particularly excited to watch and see how it plays out? I have one. I'll start. I'll, I'll start off with, um, Penn state. Speaking of James Franklin opens at West Virginia. And I think West Virginia is going to beat them. Um, and I'm just excited to watch that game because I think I think West Virginia is a team that is undervalued and Penn State might be a little overvalued. And part of that, I think, is because its, it's schedule is kind of weak outside of playing at West Virginia and, play, and hosting Ohio State. Um, like if James Franklin has anything fewer than 10 wins, like I, I think it's a bummer of a season based off how their schedule shapes up. But I could see them losing to both West Virginia and Ohio State. But I mostly just want to be proven right about how good I think West Virginia is. So I'm very interested in that game, and I think West Virginia is going to win. Okay, it's Texas and Michigan to me. Like that one is yeah. a tone setter for the entire season. Week two, we're, we're, we're going to get a real idea early of what Michigan is going to actually be. We're going to see if Quinn Ewers is ready to take the next step for Texas. We're going to see um, two of the most, you know, talented teams in the country going head to head in in one of the best, you know, in the biggest stadium in the country. Like that's going to be awesome. Like that game is going to be elite, but I think I, I'm most interested in it because it is a, a real barometer of where Michigan is going to be or what they're going to be this season. That to me, like, as we sit here on, you know, July 12th, like that is the biggest unknown. We have no idea what Michigan's really going to be under Sharon Moore. Yeah. I second that. It, it may be the most obvious choice, but that doesn't mean it's not a good one. I think that's where we're going to learn the most, and it'll have the most influence on on how we view the Ohio State Michigan rivalry and everything over the course of September through November, and where everybody's what they're playing for. Uh, that's going to set the tone for that. So it's a good one, um, great one, one that we've all got to watch. And what do we know? What time that one kick? That's on. That's a noon, right? That's a big nooner. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Not ideal necessarily for. I don't think we'll be watching it. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, Well, I mean, the Buckeyes play at seven thirty that night because it's the Western Michigan game, so we'll actually get to watch it. Okay, good. Uh, And then Wyoming, Arizona State. I think that's one that everybody's going to have to tune in for. Hell yeah, yeah, I like that. To be clear, the correct answer is Texas, Michigan. I just like pushing my own agenda. Um, But you guys, you guys are right. You're the one that's in charge of the mailbag, so you get to do whatever you want. (laughs) That's true. Um, all right. Let's Bill, get I appreciate you just going to a full on Kings of the North game. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's part. Doug and I have talked about that game like 50 times already. So, yeah, that's just front of mind for me. Um, Ohio State question. Um, this is in, like, so this is from Chris. Um, he says two, two of the most dominant teams in recent years were LSU in 2019, Alabama during the COVID season. Um, he points out that there were a couple of close games in there, but they, I think both those teams are like generally viewed as like two of the best teams that we've ever seen. Um, what does Ohio State need to do this year to be talked about in similar terms? I mean, I think obviously it's just like like we have to win the national championship, I think, but is there anything in addition to that that needs to happen for Ohio State, this Ohio State team to be considered like an all-time great team? I don't think so. I mean, because I don't, I take exception to the the belief that this LSU team was generational. Like they had a bunch of stars at the top, but, and I've said this before on a bunch of, of different podcasts with you guys, like 
I believe in the hypothetical matchup that if Ohio State had got past Clemson, that they would have beat LSU, that their defense would have feasted on what was a pretty terrible LSU offensive line. And if you go back through the course of that season and you look at some of the close calls or the times that Joe Burrow had to stay in the games late into the fourth quarter where he padded his stats because they couldn't stop anyone on defense, like I don't believe that LSU was like one of the greatest teams of all time, but they're viewed that way because they won every game and they won the games that mattered at the end. And people thought they had a fun offense. Like that's those things are all true. So if Ohio State, with all of the offseason conversation about assembling an all-star team, like if that if they pay that off by winning every single game, I think they already have a narrative that like they were the greatest collection of talent ever assembled and that people will view them that way. Like if they just went out, I think that's how they're going to fit in the conversation, no matter what the scores are. Yeah, I think we would view the 2019 Ohio State team the same way as the comment or as the question is viewing that LSU team and that uh, Alabama team. But to like drill down into what I think you have to do, obviously you need to go undefeated and win the national championship. But I think you also need a couple like major individual award winners uh, to to be in that conversation where or where you have players who are just dominant at their position like Joe Burrow yeah. was in 2019 or Devontae Smith was in 2020. Um, you know, then there's the NFL draft component. Uh, obviously, that Alabama team the next year had eight players picked in the first 38 picks of the draft, which is insane. Um, and, and LSU with with Burrow and Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson and Clyde Edwards Alaire and um, you know they obviously had a, a number of almost I think they had five first round picks as well. So like they're you know the Buckeyes are in position. I think we could already start to to see five or six first round picks next year for Ohio State. So if you can find someone to win the the major national awards, the individual awards, and then you win and, and go undefeated. I think because even though I mean LSU did not run through that schedule and blow everyone out. Alabama in the that 2020 season, I mean, in the SEC championship game, they won. They gave up 46 points to Florida, right. and, and just happened to win 52 to 46. <laughs> they also had the luxury of playing 13 games because the SEC didn't have COVID, and whereas the rest of the, the country did. And so, like, I think that they actually had a, an opportunity to be a much better and more complete fully formed team by the time the playoff happened because they didn't have rules about COVID where everyone else did. So they also got their entire roster for the national championship game, which their opponent did not. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, again, that's because COVID didn't exist there. They must've put up a plastic divider uh, on the corners of Alabama. And then COVID didn't get in. There was just a big N95 across the Mason Dixon line. Was, <laughs> you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't see it though. Uh, no, I think I think both of you guys are right. And, and Chris did mention, like in the in his question, that like Alabama did play a close game in the SEC title game. That LSU uh, played uh, one score games with Texas, Alabama, and Auburn that year. Like even like 2019, Ohio State won every game by double digits until it lost. <laughs> like that that would have been an all time dominant team had they been able to finish that that season off to Austin's point. So well, does Michigan from last year get included in this conversation or do, because of their cheating, do we just automatically dismiss them because they I gave up? Yeah. I don't think you get to to claim that kind of status when you were there's just an, getting there by some shenanigans. If, if there's an asterisk on your national championship and it hasn't still been resolved by the NCAA yet. I don't think we're going to put you in the all-time conversation. No offense, Jim Harbaugh, but that's just the bed. Offense. Made. Yeah, offense they also taken. they also played like an embarrassingly easy schedule until the end of the year. So, um, good team. I don't think they're an all-time great team. Although they, you know, fifteen and zero is fifteen and zero. So, congrats for that. I guess. Um, I think like Ohio State probably has enough juice already, right? And enough, like what like what Austin said, enough enough conversation about it that as long as it handles its business, it's probably going to be regarded as one of these teams. Um, but it has a chance to like catapult itself into something greater than that. Like I kind of, I kind of want to combine both of your answers because there there's an opportunity for like historic draft output. There's definitely an opportunity for um, individual awards. And like when I think of LSU, that LSU team and that Alabama team, like two of the best offenses we've ever seen in college football 
this Ohio State defense has a chance to be one of the best defenses we've seen in college football, at least like in, in modern college football, given all the star power and experience that that, that side of the ball is going to have. So like that, that's a way that it could be similar, I guess. Like I don't, I don't know that I am expecting yeah, like Ohio one, offense. one super dominant unit. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. it's like an all time, like 2021 Georgia and that defense kind, kind of deal. Right. So I, I think, I think that's on the table for this team, but um, really I do think it's as simple as like everyone expects you to win in the national championship. And if you do it, you're going to be revered for it. So in, in, in a similar fashion, I think, I think and, it's simple. And Bill, it will be because there's going to be something unique and special about being the first one to win in the expanded playoff. Like you'll have yeah. had to earn it in a way that mm-hmm. no previous team ever has had to do, which, you know, worked in 2014 Ohio State's favor. See if that can happen again. Uh, how long do we want this episode to be? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I could do this all day. Save, okay. put a pen in them. Let's just have a, a bonus one. Let's, let's do it again for Monday. Okay. Can I, let me, can I ask one more? Yeah. Kind of a, more of a, of a fun one. We may have answered this before, so I apologize. Who are your guys' favorite athletes of all time? That's from this. This question was from a person uh, whose name I think was backwards on the text. So I think this is from Clem, but if you're the, Clem is your last name, I apologize, but you know who asked the question. <laughs> um like currently or when we were kids or what just whatever like when you think like oh man that, that's my guy who should we go sport by sport we can go sport sure. by sport yeah oh my name philly dudes so yeah no surprise there <laughs> baseball we'll start berm used to be a baseball player of some repute until he got uh pulled in his senior championship game <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with that that's not really how the story goes but i oh it's uh, not you want to tell it no, uh, I huh. didn't get pulled. I had to exit the game because I'd thrown 10 innings in 72 hours, and that stupid rule uh, forced me to leave the game with a four-run lead, and we lo- gave up five runs in the bottom of the seventh to lose in the state championship game. Uh, that's irrelevant to this conversation, though, so I'm not sure why. And, and I know that you brought this up because you know that Bill and I are going to say that Larry Jones is not the best third baseman of all time. <laughs> um, Wrong. So... Um, I actually have the mindset that Nolan Arenado might be the best third baseman of all time at, at this point. Um, that's neither here nor there. I know Michael Jack Schmidt is still in the conversation, Bill. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, baseball. Let's start there is baseball. no conversation after Chipper Jones. He is okay. my guy, and he's the greatest third baseman. Nay, the greatest baseball player of all time. My favorite baseball player growing up was Eric Davis, uh, who I think would have been a hall of famer without any question if he could have ever stayed healthy um he was electric electric boogie woogie woogie electric he was Mm -hmm. incredible is one of only at the i mean i don't know if anyone's done it since but like in 1986 he had 27 homers 80 steals in like his first full season in the majors he he was going to be the first 40 40 player until he broke his wrist uh, with like two months to go in the season in 1987 when he had 37 homers and 50 steals. And then Jose Canseco did it the next year because he's a cheater, uh, but whatever. Um, And uh, it's definitely Eric Davis. I also loved Roger Clemens because I was a pitcher and that's what I, he was my favorite pitcher and and Greg Maddox. Roger Clemens was your favorite pitcher? Uh, it, I, it right was after between, you bash Jose Canseco for being, it a was cheater. between him and it, it was between him and Greg Maddox. Uh, but Maddox was one I very different, very different. Watched a there. lot more. Yeah, I loved watching Greg Maddox. So baseball, yeah. that that's my my group. It's a lot of guys. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna not say any Philly guys to make it less obvious. Oh, um, come on, because my answers are all Philly. Yeah, but like the the answers are all Philly guys. But I'm gonna pick non Philly guys just for the sake of being more interesting. But but uh, for a Philly guy, would you be picking Darren Dalton or John Crook? Crook, baby, Crook's my guy. Okay. I love Crook. Crook was also good. Crook yeah. Crook hit a single to finish with a career 300 batting average and then just retired on first base like an absolute boss. I'm He's out, the man. Yeah. Um, as for me, baseball like non Philly guys, it's actually it is Roger Clemens. I love Roger Clemens. He was he was by by a significant margin like my favorite non Philly player. I love watching two him votes for Roger Clemens. It's just wow. a bulldog. Just a dude. Bulldog, he's just man. a dominant player, man. <laughs> like he just did any. You could tell he physically did not like people he was playing against, and I appreciate that. Yeah, huh. me too. I wonder what changed after the you know his career kind of plateaued and he started regressing, and then this dominant player that you guys are speaking of. I wonder wonder what might have caused that. 
Has anybody found out? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think who can, who can say? I think that if who you're in a league go? when ninety percent of the players are cheating, then you are too. It's not really cheating. Why did you just say that about Jose Canseco then? Because he was doing it when not 90% of the league was. Oh, come on. He he started it. He started it. Yes. Yeah. Jose Canseco is definitely smart. If you look at the numbers, he did. He was doing that in the, in the late eighties, the, the Canseco or the, the Sosa Maguire famously clean era of baseball, the, the Sosa Maguire bonds, Clemens, all that stuff was at the end of the nineties. It was Canseco who kick the door open for drugs <laughs> basketball i think barry bonds is the one who wants credit for that more than jose can say barry bonds just did it better than anyone else but he I was love, still the, maybe barry the bonds. best player in baseball he was still the best player in baseball before he started doing drugs it was like he won like four yeah. mvps before that so you know it was stupid he was just doing it to keep up to keep up with the Consecos and the joneses and you know which jones i'm talking about larry chipper um, okay, so basketball, huh. um, basketball. My my Toledo roots want me to say Jim Jackson because I thought he was just unbelievable watching him growing up. But obviously, it's Michael Jordan. I mean, yeah. mine's Shaq. It's actually Allen Iverson, obviously, but aside from him, it's Shaq. I uh, yeah. I mean, I'm a child of the '80s, so obviously, I grew up watching and cheering for Michael Jordan and the Bulls. Um, around, I, when I was living in Wyoming and we moved there, I used to, uh, like facetiously cheer for the nuggets because they were absolutely horrifically bad. And I, my joke would be like, I liked college basketball more and the nuggets were the only college basketball team that were in the NBA. (laughs) And then they drafted Carmelo and it was like, oh, this could suddenly be pretty fun. And I remember watching that whole run with, uh, Melo and Syracuse, um, you know, by coincidence, my wife was going to Syracuse at that time, so it added a little affinity down the road. I just, I think Carmelo, because he never wound up like with as many rings as LeBron or any rings at all. That any he rings, kind of, yeah, any rings at all. <laughs> he gets kind of overlooked, but man, he was just such such a fun basketball player, and it, like seeing him grow and develop in Denver and like going to a number of those games when I was in college was a really cool experience. He got the better of LeBron in some of those, but obviously. Not any of the, the trophies that truly mattered for him, so he's going to be lost a little bit to uh, the dustbin of history. But he, I really, I really enjoyed the Carmelo Anthony experience. I wonder if I'm a growing up was a quasi Michigan State fan because Steve Smith, Michigan State uh, shooting guard, was also very high on my list of guys I just loved watching play. And my favorite football player growing up was Andre Risen from Michigan State. So I wonder if oh, I wow. got to the bottom of this. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> That's why you still have residents in the state of Michigan. Check that birth certificate, bro. <laughs> must be. Must be. I must be. I'm just a little bro. Little bro. Um, Andre Risen was my favorite as a kid. I, I liked the Falcons when they went to the like all black uniforms. So I it was a couple of years when I got off the Bengals train. Um, but that was, you know, necessary for my sanity. Yeah. Okay. So we're on football now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Non-Eagle, Barry Sanders. Mm-hmm. Barry's great. Yeah. Good. good. Pretty good. Your football. favorite Eagle, Brian Dawkins? Yes. Yes. I'm so good at this game. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's answered that one before. <laughs> yeah, I definitely have. Uh, whatever. I'm so good. I think at Brian Dawkins things. is like actually my all-time favorite athlete. Like Because he's a Philly guy, right? I mean, he went to... Oh, wait a second. Oh, oh, oh he did. <laughs> No, no, no Brian, Brian, Brian Westbrook went to Villanova. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got Brian my Brian's Dawkins. confused. Brian no. Dawkins went to Clemson, I think. Oh, yeah. Huh. Anyway, Austin, Barry, who's the football Barry player? Sanders. Um, I can remember, this is kind of funny. Bill might get a kick out of it. Like the first actual like sports card PC that I had for football was Drew Bledsoe. I don't know Ooh. why, but... Hmm. Um, I would, you know, in when I was born in Oklahoma, the Cowboys were the closest thing. They were, it was before they even became, you know, the America's team dynasty in the nineties. Like, it's like I was, I was on the front side of that and I was a Cowboys fan until I just kind of like grew out of fandom for whatever reason, um, for the NFL moving to Wyoming, I think was a part of that. But, 
Um, I would just watch. I watched Drew Bledsoe in college. I watched him when he got to the Patriots, and I don't know why. I just gravitated towards him, and I, I thought he was a fun quarterback to follow. Wasn't and, Drew Bledsoe basically 1997's Josh Allen? So is I mean, sort of. <laughs> the f- <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, <clears throat> hockey. How dare no- you, sir? This is another one where I'm conflicted uh, because my favorite player growing up was Sergei Fedorov, but I was also insanely jealous of him dating Anna Kornikova because 19 year old me Fair. was like love hate relationship. You know, yeah, so but he was definitely my favorite player to watch. Also, you have a favorite hockey player? Yeah the f- the first sweater that I ever owned, and then it wound up being multiple versions. And I. I think I still have this uh, throwback Nordiques version. Joe Sackick was my uh, favorite hockey player growing up. Like, not even close. Had to be him. Yeah. Um, my answer is actually Eric Lindros. But <laughs> if I have to pick a non stunner, a non flyer, uh, like I-, I oddly really loved Ray Bork when I was a kid. I was a defenseman, and I just liked Ray Bork. I don't know why just like followed his entire career. I collected his cards. I used to like draw um, like hockey comic strips when I was a kid and they were all about Ray Bork. Like, <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know why. I was Where are they? Can we get I, some I, of those? I, they don't exist anymore. But I what was, were those called? Did, they have, did, did, did the comic remember. strip have a name? Probably. I can't remember. It wasn't very, they weren't very good. Uh, if you can imagine. You were, you um, were the, you were the president of Bork's dorks. <laughs> yeah, truly, truly. I was the fan club. I was like, yeah. Um, Way too uh, ecstatic for like when Ray Bork finally won a Stanley Cup with the Avalanche, even though like I wasn't a particularly big fan of the Avalanche. Yeah, because of Joe Sackick, they were great. No, I like Joe Sackick. I like Peter Forsberg, Patrick Wall. Like I actually did like a lot of those guys. Yeah, I hated those guys. They were a fun. They were a fun team, and that rivalry. They don't make them like that anymore for the NHL with the Red Wings, Red Wings and Avs. That was fun to be. four hours up the road from Denver for that and being able to watch all those games. Um, but we're missing one professional sport, Bill. What could it be? That's right. Hmm. Graps. <laughs> Graps. Best favorite pro wrestler. Burham actually has that because you said you watched it yeah, in the, the late nineties in the Atti- attitude era. Oh, that's the ultimate, pro- the ultimate the warrior era. was my favorite growing up without question. Uh, okay. uh, in the attitude era, it was Shawn Michaels. Hmm. Oh, okay. Heartbreak kid. Uh, I I liked all the, the the big dudes. So Kane is probably my favorite. I love that. Yeah. My favorite of all time and started in the when WCW was great. I just Chris Jericho for some reason was so overlooked. And I remember Nitro and Thunder made multiple sp- stops in Casper, and he would always come there, and just like he was such a great heel, he would run us down and make like horrible jokes about Casper, but that has always endeared me. I've always been a mark for heels ever since I was a kid. And I was for Chris Jericho then. And I, I don't really know what he's doing in AEW now. Um, and because he's there, I don't care, but Chris Jericho was definitely (laughs) my favorite, uh, growing up. And right now I know Berm's favorite is Sami Zayn. I rewatched the Iron Bull uh, or the Iron Claw, sorry, uh, yesterday for the third time, and uh, you guys still haven't watched it. And uh, you've seen it three times. It's so good. It's wow. so good. Wow, it's so good. I should probably watch it. It's I was going to so turn good. it on the other night, but you said that like I was going to cry, so I don't really want to. You might cry. It's it's a it is a tearjerker. <laughs> you might not. I mean, you know, it's about you know brotherhood in a way, and you don't really you don't have a brother, so um it's it's different i think for me like as a brother movie since i have six of them <clears throat> you don't like Sami Zayn, just to be clear no i, I don't think. i don't at all i, I think do. he's terrible who he do my, you he's, he's my current favorite so yeah. screw off firm if you did have to name somebody current who would it be of like what i've watched with you guys favorite currently i don't really know that i have, I mean, I like Cody Rhodes as a. I think I like him because I think he seems like a genuine person. So I would probably lean towards Cody Rhodes. Hmm. Answer accepted. Not Damian, Damian Priest. Priest. That's what I. I'll tell you that. Anybody but Damian Priest. That dude's terrible. I know Bill's other answer, which is Rhea Ripley, who is now back. 
That's right. Mommy's, mommy's and that's a good time for us to hang up. <laughs> oh, it is. It's time. Yeah, the folks, the people don't love when we go into the wrestling. Yep. Oh well, the Can't best we can next, do. Look at them next time. Can't win Sometimes them all. that's what we say, right, Bill? I'm sorry, or you're welcome. That's Either right. way, we've got all the bases covered. There are so many questions. I think we just decided in real time. We'll just dive into them again for Monday's podcast daily, and we'll that way we don't have to just dive right back into the defense with the state of the position series. We can save it. That'll get us through the last week until Big Ten Media Days, which is going to be a glorious, glorious time for everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for the longest episode of the Podcast Daily that has ever been recorded. It's not even close to the longest Kings of Columbus, though, so Bill could go longer, but I can't. We're done on the Podcast Daily. Freaky Friday is over. Thanks for your questions. We'll get to more of them on Monday. For Bill and Burham, I'm Austin. So long.